On February 24, 1978, a 55-year-old man named Joseph Shons from Sacramento was driving his Volkswagen Beetle in the Sierra Nevada mountain peaks. It was already dark outside, and snow was falling incessantly. He ventured there to check the snow conditions because the next day, on Saturday, he planned to take his wife and daughter skiing to their family vacation cabin in the mountains. Around half past five in the afternoon, he reached the dirt road leading to the house, but it was nearly impossible to progress due to snowdrifts. After barely covering 50 meters, his car got stuck. Eerie silence and pitch black trees surrounded him. He tried to free himself, but suddenly felt unwell, experiencing chest pain. He returned to his car, turned up the heat, and waited. For hours, he lay in the car, tormented by intense pain, displaying symptoms of a heart attack. The timing could hardly have been worse. Time passed, and then, about six hours later, around midnight, in the middle of nowhere, he suddenly heard a whistling sound from outside, further along the impassable mountain road where he was also stranded. He got out of his car and noticed a foreign car, a pickup, not far from him, with its headlights directed toward him. Six people emerged from the car and stood in front of the lights. He didn't recognize any of them, only vaguely remembering that there was a woman holding a baby among them. He heard the dark figures conversing. The man called out to them for help, but at that moment, the strangers immediately fell silent and the car headlights were turned off. After this, Shons returned to his car and lay down again. However, something happened again a few hours later. He looked out the window and saw flashlights approaching, all directed towards him. But when he asked for help for the second time, the flashlights were turned off again. Then the people fell silent and disappeared into the darkness among the trees. The man stayed in his car until the fuel ran out early in the morning. By then, he felt well enough to start walking. Along the way, from the direction where he heard the whistling, he noticed an abandoned turquoise and white Mercury Mornigo. He didn't pay much attention to the deserted car at first, only realizing its significance later when he read the news. He walked about 13 kilometers to a place called Mountain House, where he stopped for a drink. Eventually, the owner gave him a ride home. Joseph Shons was later accompanied to the hospital by his wife, where doctors confirmed that he had indeed suffered a heart attack. Let's go back in time a bit. Just nine days after Ted Bundy was arrested for the second time following his escape, practically the entire American media and public were discussing it during that period. But then, something else happened. On February 24, 1978, a basketball game was held at the California State University campus in Chico. The local Wildcats were playing against the Davis campus team. About 80 kilometers south of here, in Yuba City and Marysville in Yuba County. Five friends were getting ready to cheer for the Davis team. The group consisted of 29-year-old William Sterling, 32-year-old Ted Weiher, 30-year-old Jack Madruga, 24-year-old Jack Hewett, and 25-year-old Gary Mathias. They were all basketball enthusiasts and played together on the local team called Gateway Gators, which was established for mentally challenged and psychologically ill individuals. Gary Mathias had served in the U.S. Army in West Germany in the early 70s, where he developed drug problems, leading to a diagnosis of schizophrenia. He was eventually discharged and returned to his parents in Yuba City, receiving treatment at a local mental institution. Despite facing difficulties, including aggressive behavior and psychotic episodes, Mathias was successfully treated on an outpatient basis, considered a significant success by his doctors. In the two years leading up to his disappearance, there were no signs of schizophrenia and he had no encounters with the police. Among the other four men, Sterling and Hewitt were mildly intellectually disabled, and Madruga, a military truck driver between 66 and 68, was considered slower than average. All of them lived with their parents in either Yuba City or the nearby Marysville. These five men played basketball together and were very close friends. Their favorite pastime was attending basketball games when they weren't playing. On the day of their university outing, they were eagerly preparing for their own game scheduled for the next day, on February 25th, as part of a week-long tournament. They were so excited that they had been talking about it for weeks. Some had already laid out their jerseys, and Gary Mathias specifically asked his parents to wake him up early on the day of the game. 
The idea to go cheer for the UC Davis basketball team in Chico instead of resting was not attributed to a specific person, but they all decided to do so. Among the group, only Madruga had a driver's license. Since he never let anyone else take the wheel, he ended up driving the others north, about 80 kilometers to the game venue, in his 1969 turquoise and white Mercury Mornigo. Their families affectionately referred to them as the boys. When the friends set out, they weren't dressed warmly, just wearing thin jackets, which, in hindsight, wasn't unusual since they were only planning a round-trip car ride. However, in late February, the weather in the Sacramento Valley is usually quite chilly. They made it to the game and cheered throughout. Moreover, their team won, giving them a reason to celebrate. After likely relaxing a bit more, they drove a short distance to Bear's Market, where they purchased a cherry and a lemon pie, a Snickers and a Marathon chocolate bar each, two Pepsis and two boxes of milk. The encounter at the market was memorable and the clerk could easily recall it because the group arrived shortly before the store's 10 p.m. closing time, causing the staff to start closing later than usual. After this, they should have headed home. Some parents regularly stayed awake until their children returned. Nevertheless, after leaving the store, they got into the car and drove south. Unfortunately, that was the last time they were seen alive. Ted Y. has mother woke up worried at 5 a.m. and immediately called Bill Sterling's mother who had been awake since 2 a.m. and had previously spoken with Hewett. When they didn't return home in the morning, they didn't wait any longer and notified the police around 8 a.m. First, they thoroughly examined the routes between Yuba City and Chico, but found no trace of the five friends until a few days later when a wildlife officer in the Plumas National Park, east of the two cities, reported to authorities. On February 25th, the day after the game, he saw the abandoned Mornigo near the Oroville Quincy Road, not far from the forest. However, since locals often drove into the mountains by car during winter for skiing, it was initially not considered significant. Finally, on February 28, he led the police to the car, which was parked near a closed road called Rogers Cow Camp. Madruga's car was 110 kilometers away from the game location, on a remote, high-altitude, forested and snow-covered road that did not lead towards Yuba City. This is particularly strange because even their families couldn't explain why they might be there. When the police arrived, one window was rolled down, which was extremely surprising considering the cold weather and heavy snowfall on the night the five men went missing. Inside the car, they found the bags of candies purchased from the Chico store, as well as the boxes and bottles of drinks. This clearly indicated that they had reached the mountain road in that specific car, leaving only half of the marathon chocolate behind. Similarly, they found informational brochures about the basketball game and, among three other items in the glove compartment, a folded California road map. It remains puzzling why they went there because, as mentioned earlier, each of them was extremely excited about their basketball game the next day and had to wake up early. Logically, after cheering, they should have gone straight home but instead, they first went to a suburban store and then to a dark mountain road. Sterling's father mentioned that he once took his son to Bucks Lake, near the location where the car was found, for a weekend fishing trip, but Sterling didn't feel well in the mountains and later did not join him anymore. Similarly, Madruga's parents said their son hated the cold and had never been in the mountains. They reached an altitude of about 1,300 meters by car, and they stopped slightly above the snow line at that time. The road was already closed not far from there. At some point that evening, the five men decided to abandon the car, even though, as later discovered, it still had a quarter tank of fuel, enough to get them home, and they could have turned on the heating. After the car got stuck in the snow, they tried to free it, but the wheel spun. For some unknown reason, they simply left it there, even though the police believed that the five adult men could easily have pushed the car out since the snow layer was not too deep. Initially, they thought maybe they left it because it might have broken down, but during testing, the police were able to start the Mornigo on the first try, confirming that it was mechanically fine. However, the ignition key was nowhere to be found, and further investigations revealed more peculiarities. Starting with the fact that there were no dents, scratches, or even mud traces found on the car's chassis or the low-hanging exhaust pipe. This is peculiar because they were traveling on a muddy and snowy road before they stopped. Based on this, authorities concluded that the driver was either extremely cautious or familiar with the terrain, 
which definitely wasn't the case for Madruga. Speaking of Madruga, his family mentioned that he would never leave his car with rolled down windows. However, this happened, and the car was also unlocked, which was out of character for him. Unfortunately, the official search yielded no results, they found no trace of the five men. Jack Beecham, the Yuba County undersheriff, stated that they had no idea what happened to them. He added that the area was one of the most dangerous in the entire state. Sheriff Jim Grant admitted that even he once went there alone but could only find his way out using a compass in the dense forest. There are areas accessible only on horseback, so the search involved horses, search dogs, off-road vehicles, and helicopters, but nothing was found. The sheriff also mentioned that although the missing men had intellectual disabilities, they were capable of leading relatively normal lives, except when they were in stressful situations, causing significant changes in their behavior. Several reports came in, with people claiming to have seen them after leaving Chico. Some reported spotting them in Tampa, others in Ontario, and yet another in a Sacramento movie theater in the company of an older man. However, most of these reports were quickly dismissed. Joseph Shons, mentioned at the beginning of the video, had one of the reports deemed credible. Another report came from a woman who requested anonymity. She encountered the missing flyers and the $1,215 reward posted by the families on March 3rd in Brownsville, about 50 kilometers south, as the crow flies, from where the abandoned car was found. She worked at Mary's Country Store and claimed that two days after their disappearance, the five men stopped at the store around 2 p.m. with a 1950s red pickup. The store owner, Carol Walsh, also confirmed this. The woman stated that two went to an outdoor phone booth, two stayed in the car, and one went into the store. Walsh also mentioned seeing some of them on February 25th, Saturday, and on February 26th, Sunday. He was able to identify two of them, claiming that Wyher and Hewett purchased burritos, chocolate milk, and soda from him on one occasion. An employee identified Jack Hewett at the phone booth. On the other hand, Ted Wyher's brother, Dallas Wyher, told the Los Angeles Times that it was out of character for him to ride in a stranger's car and be in a strange city, while completely ignoring the long-awaited basketball game. However, they also spoke about him doing senseless things like buying pencils for $100 without any reason, or not understanding why it was necessary to stop at a stop sign. There was also an incident when their house caught fire, and instead of reacting, he lay down on his bed, watched the ceiling burn, and told his brother to let him rest because he was tired from work. He had to be dragged out of the burning building. Jack Hewett was the most intellectually disabled among the five men. He couldn't read, write, or even dial a phone. His brother mentioned that he hated using the phone so much that he would have his brother talk to his friends on his behalf. Therefore, it was strange that he was seen at the phone booth. This is all the information authorities have gathered so far about the five missing men. The search was unsuccessful, but the toughest part is yet to come. On June 4, more than three months later, as the snow began to melt in the higher points of the mountains, a small group of motorcyclists drove to an 18-meter residential container in the middle of the forest. The container was maintained by the Forestry Service and was located approximately 31 kilometers away from the abandoned Mornigo. When they arrived, they discovered that the front window of the container was broken. Upon entering, a nauseating odor overwhelmed them, and shortly afterward, they noticed a partially decomposed body lying on the bed. The body belonged to 32-year-old Ted Wyher, one of the missing men, with his hands placed on his chest and covered with eight sheets, including his head. The motorcyclists immediately notified the police, and later, the body was identified. The autopsy revealed that Wyher died from pulmonary edema, hypothermia, and essentially, starvation. He had lost almost half of his weight, reducing from his pre-disappearance weight of 91 kilograms, indicating a prolonged period without sufficient food. Significant beard growth on his face suggested that he might have survived for an estimated 8 to 13 weeks after his disappearance. His feet were gangrenous, and all five toes were completely frozen, showing signs of blood poisoning. His trousers were rolled up on both legs. Beside the bed, personal items were found, including his brown leather wallet with money, a ring engraved with Ted, and a gold necklace. There was also a half-burned candle on the table and a Waltham gold watch, neither of which belonged to any of the missing men. 
He was wearing only a striped velour shirt and green trousers, with his shoes not found at the scene. Despite the apparent hardship Wyher faced, the investigators were puzzled. The container, maintained by the Forestry Service, was well equipped with survival essentials. The police discovered plenty of matches, firewood, and books for kindling, yet the fireplace had not been used previously. Additionally, they found all the forest clothing stored on site, which could have provided warmth for the men. Even more perplexing was the fact that, although the friends took out 31 cans of specially preserved military food from an external storage, there was still untouched food in another section of the storage that could have sustained them for a year. In another storage area, untouched gas canisters were found, ready to activate the container's heating system. It appeared that Ted Weiher was not alone, Gary Mathias' tennis shoes were found, and the cans were opened with a military opener, knowledge limited to Mathias and Madruga. The left shoes and the fact that Weiher was found barefoot on the bed suggested that Mathias might have worn Weiher's warmer leather shoes. The numerous sheets covering Weiher indicated that he likely wasn't alone because of the pain from gangrenous feet making it improbable for him to cover himself with so many sheets. After the discovery of the first victim, the search team followed the path between the residential container and the abandoned car. The next day, Madruga and Sterling's bodies were found on opposite sides of the road, more than 18 kilometers away from the car. Madruga's body was already partially consumed by forest animals and dragged toward a stream, where they found Montego's keys in his pocket. Only Sterling's bones remained in a smaller area, scattered around. According to police records, Madruga died of hypothermia, but Sterling's cause of death couldn't be determined precisely. Experts suggested that perhaps one of them got tired and couldn't continue, while the other refused to leave them alone, leading to their demise. It was unlikely for both of them to freeze to death simultaneously in the same location. After the discovery of the first victims, Jack Hewitt's father was kindly asked by the investigators not to participate further in the search, but he continued nonetheless. On June 8th, he found his son's jacket under a bush. Lifting it revealed the remains of the child's spine, located three kilometers northeast of the container. Identification was initially made based on the nearby found shoes and trousers. The next day, the undersheriff found a skull 91 meters downhill from the bush. Dental analysis confirmed it belonged to Huet, but the exact cause of death couldn't be determined. Only one person from the group remained missing, Gary Mathias. A rusty, turned-off flashlight and three woolen blankets were found 400 meters from the container near a road, but this did not necessarily indicate that he left them there. The search concluded on June 19th, with authorities covering 130 square kilometers in over 6,000 work hours. However, they found no trace of Gary Mathias. The problem with this whole matter is that the investigators couldn't even figure out why they went up into the mountains in the first place. What's certain is that before they went to Chico for the basketball game, they were still completely excited about their own race the next day. Therefore, something must have happened during or after the game that changed their plans, and part of this might have been going to the suburban store. It's worth mentioning a few words about the only one still treated as missing, Gary Mathias, as reports describe him as a very contradictory personality. For example, the police found out that he had a friend in a town called Forbestown, towards which you can eventually reach Yuba City, and perhaps they headed there guided by a spontaneous idea. The theory goes that after Oroville, they might have taken the wrong direction, and instead of heading towards Forbestown, they continued straight on Highway 162, which leads to the campsite where their car was eventually found. However, the police questioned Mathias' friend, but he denied seeing the missing man around that time. It's also a mystery why they didn't free the car, or if they couldn't, why they didn't go back the way they came, where at least they knew what was waiting for them. For example, they would have stumbled upon the same lodge where Joseph Schontz later went. What the police revealed is that just a day before their disappearance, the forestry service passed through the same road with mountain snowplows towards the container, presumably to clear its top so it wouldn't collapse under the snow. According to authorities, it's also a possibility that perhaps they followed the snowplow tracks believing that shelter might be close. And when they arrived, they broke in through the window, perhaps thinking they were on private property and therefore didn't dare to use the equipment there. Several members of the group were prone to irrational behavior due to their mental state. It's entirely possible they starved rather than eat something they believed was stolen. 
Quietly, I'll add that since there's no mention of a phone in the container, it's assumed there wasn't one, though it might have saved their lives that evening. However, according to credible reports, the five men, after their disappearance, went shopping in Brownsville with an unidentified red pickup truck, literally returning to civilization. Gary Mathias had to take his medication twice a day for his schizophrenia, three in the morning and three in the evening. His stepfather said that if he didn't take these pills for two weeks, he started talking to himself and his condition quickly deteriorated. His doctor said he diagnosed him five years earlier, but there were no signs in the two years before his disappearance, according to his family, who said he regularly took his medication. What is certain is that nearby mental institutions didn't see him. It turned out that before treatment, he attacked the sheriff's men once, molested the sleeping wife of a cousin, and threatened a couple and their three-year-old child once, saying he would kill them. It's also important information that just a few months before the disappearances, he joined a program for the mentally impaired, and only then did he start making friends with the others, whom he didn't know before. The other four men were very close-knit, but according to reports, Matthias somehow differed from them. They said he was a strong personality, the only one in the group who would have fought back if attacked. In an interview in 1978, an old friend, Janet Inzera, said that Matthias told her several times how good it would be to disappear with others. Initially, the families thought that against their will, someone or some people might have forced the group to go up into the mountains, leaving the car behind in the forest. Authorities then expressed their concern that Matthias might be involved in the entire disappearance, but I emphasize strongly that there is no evidence to support this. Apart from the investigative documents, light was shared on an interesting phone call. Three weeks after the disappearances, an unknown man called a woman named Debbie Reese from Yuba City. The woman picked up the phone and greeted him, to which the stranger said, I know where the five missing men are, and then hung up. The next day, the same man called again, this time saying, I need help because I really hurt those guys. The woman asked, who did you hurt? And the response was, don't play with me, and the man hung up again. The following day, on March 17th, a third call came, in which the man said, all five men are dead. All dead? Reese asked, to which came the reply, all dead, and once again, the man hung up, and the woman never heard from him again. It is very important that there were five victims, so in principle, this also applied to Mathias. Regarding this case, the then deputy sheriff, Jack Beecham, said a few years ago that he had been with the office for 50 years, but this case never left his mind. The last development occurred in 2006, when Mark Mathias, Gary's brother, checked in with the sheriff's office in response to a routine inquiry, stating that his brother had still not been found. None of the friends had wives or children, and most of their parents had died since then, and Yuba County has still not forgotten the tragedy of the men who disappeared in the dark mountains and snowy forests. What did they think could have caused the boys' deaths? Could Matthias have had anything to do with it? Or could he have died too? Write your opinions in the comments.